is a special coronavirus exclusive with Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves on Jackson 16 WAPT News. Well, good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight for this look at the coronavirus pandemic here in Mississippi. A crisis certainly like nothing we have seen before, affecting the world and the U.S. with more cases than any other country. We're sitting down this evening with Governor Tate Reeves, having a discussion about the state's response to COVID-19 and whether the strategy to slow the spread of the coronavirus is working. So first of all, Governor Reeves, thank you for joining us tonight. Well, Megan, thank you so much for having me on this evening. Yeah, and before we jump into our conversation here, I understand you have a message for the people of Mississippi. Well, that's right. Look, we, we are working very hard to convince Mississippians to do the right thing. Stay home, stay healthy, um, take care of yourself and take care of your neighbors. These are very challenging times, the likes of which we haven't seen in America in well over a hundred years. Um, and I understand that this is hard. Uh, we are a people that likes to be out and about. We like to spend time with our friends and our families. Um, and I'm convinced that if over the next several weeks uh, we will commit to our shelter-in-place order and we will commit to complying with it, uh, we will put this behind us and we will uh, get to get back to our, our lives. But we've got to commit over the next two weeks to do the right thing. And talking about the next two weeks, are the models still showing April 18th as, as the peak of COVID-19 in Mississippi? Well, that is the most recent models that we have seen. Um, but I will tell you, those models change every single day. And, and honestly, over a period of time, uh, over the weekend, in an approximately 12 to 36 hour period, uh, they significantly reduced what the outlook was in terms of total number of cases and total number of deaths. Um, that tells me that our um, precautionary measures are working. Uh, but again, our job as leaders in Mississippi is to prepare for the worst, mm -hmm. pray for the best, and expect somewhere in between. And that's what we're trying to do is, is exactly that. Yeah. If this model does hold true or even stay somewhere in the vicinity of April 18th, do you think there'll be a need to extend your shelter in place order? Well, that's something that we're going to monitor very closely. You know, one of the reasons that we are doing all the things that we are doing, both from a preventative measure standpoint, but also in terms of attacking uh, the, the virus and attacking the number of people who are, are, ch are, are um, being quarantined and isolated, uh, is to slow the spread. What, we, what, what would be the worst case scenario is if we found ourselves in a situation in which, which we had a hospital system that was truly stretched. We know that our healthcare workers are working around the clock, but we're setting up measures right now to ensure that we have the, the correct number of beds. We announced yesterday that uh, we have about 3,000 beds across the state that are available at the peak. Um, given our uh, analysis, we could need 392 additional beds. I have teams in South Mississippi and North Mississippi doing assessments, one at Camp Shelby in the Hattiesburg area, another in Northeast Mississippi, trying to identify to ensure that we have those 400 beds available. In addition to that, we know at the peak we could have a need for as many as 300 additional ICU beds. Uh, we have activated the system which ensures that our hospitals are going to uh, make those beds available um, through excess capacity. And so we're making real progress to ensure that that's not the case, but we've got to monitor the new cases and the, and the number of people hospitalized every single day uh, from here forward. You talked about the beds, the ICU beds, the hospital beds. Is that the most critical need for hospitals right now, or, or what is the most critical need for hospitals? Well, the, the critical needs, and, and I don't want to say that one is more important than the other, uh, but and by the way, when we look at the April 1 model uh, that, that we are analyzing, uh, we are trying to ensure that we have 150% of expected needs when it comes to beds, ICU beds, as well as ventilators. And so we're, we're planning again for a, a worst case scenario. But when you look at the needs, uh, we feel comfortable that we'll be able to get the additional 400 beds that, that meet that criteria. We feel uh, confident that working with our hospitals that we will have uh, necessary ICU beds. We're still working to uh, acquire more ventilators 
as you have heard me say over the last couple of weeks, we've been successful at, at taking 500 ventilators that were battery powered and putting them into a mode, working with Mississippi State University uh, and their innovators and, and, and others to recast uh, those ventilators such that they now can be plugged into a wall. So now they're both um, AV as well as battery operated. So that's gonna help us uh, meet the demand in terms of number of ventilators that are needed at the peak. Um, and so all of those are, are issues that have been laid out by our strategic planning team uh, we think we have a plan to to actually meet the the demands if it if it falls into the uh, confines of what we expect to happen. Um, but we've just got to always plan for the worst, and we're continuing to work uh, to acquire PPE and other uh, materials. I'll tell you, Megan, one of the things that we've got to also be mindful of, and this is what I put um, or asked Dr. Hayes and Dr. Brunson and their teams to continue to meet is. Um, while we may have enough rooms and we may have enough ventilators, we also have to have enough healthcare workers that can operate and, and operate the ventilators and, and things such as that. And so we're doing everything that we can to, to bring back maybe some retired physicians, retired healthcare workers. We're also working with the nursing board and the state medical association to see if we can utilize the services of those that are um, near graduation and in school again making sure that we have all the resources in place that we need and can you talk about how those efforts are going to get maybe retired nurses or some of these graduates who are supposed to be graduating in just a couple weeks back into the workforce or into the workforce in any any numbers of workers that you may have back out there well the the, the efforts are going very well mississippians are doing what mississippians do in times of need we step up and we are helping our friends and our neighbors uh, have been overwhelmed by the outpouring of support, the number of people who have said, you know, we, we are interested in doing this. The other thing you've got to remember, Megan, is there are in, in many hospitals across the state and quite frankly across the country, with elective surgeries being eliminated, um, people are not out uh, driving as often and so we're having less car wrecks. And so in certain areas of the state, in certain areas of hospitals, uh, their workload is down 20, 30, 40, 50%. And so what we've got to make sure that happens, I, I'm convinced that we have enough of everything that we need statewide, but if you have a need for 100 ventilators in Hancock County and you have 100 ventilators in Tishomingo County, well, as a state, I can say we have plenty of ventilators. Mm -hmm. But if those ventilators aren't where the patients are that need them, then we're not doing, we're not actually accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish to make sure everybody has what they need. And so it's a major logistics effort. We've, we've enlisted the Mississippi National Guard to help us from a logistics standpoint. We have activated uh, over 250 guardsmen at this point to, to help us with that. And so I feel confident that the, the Dr. Hayes and his team are, are utilizing our trauma care system as a model to make sure we get resources where it needs to be. Um, and, but we've got uh, a challenge. We've got to monitor it every single day between now and the ultimate peak resource period. You know, we have heard federal officials say this, this 30 days to slow, to slow the spread across the country. When will we know if that's working here in Mississippi? Well, if you pay attention to the models, then we have to believe that what we are doing is working significantly because we have been on a, a significant downward trend based upon the models uh, really for the last 15 to, to 20 days. The, every state is at a different phase in their cycle. Obviously, New York and New Jersey are much further along in the cycle than, say, Mississippi is. And in fact, even New Orleans and Louisiana is further along in the cycle than Mississippi is. And so um, I think we can say with relative certainty that the, the measures that we have put in place are working. We are slowing the spread. We have fewer cases today than was originally projected. However, what we don't know is are we, are we slowing the spread to the point where our hospital system is situated where we can handle the, the maximum number of cases at the peak. And that's what we're going to be waiting and watching to see and what you guys are preparing for right now. That is exactly what we're preparing for. And again, we are, we're not only trying to prepare for what we expect to happen, we're trying to prepare for what we anticipate being the worst case scenario. 150% of the 
model as it was the middle of last week, not the model as it was yesterday. You mentioned the state of Louisiana, sort of the, the hotbed of COVID-19 cases in, in the South right now. Do you anticipate any need to potentially add checkpoints along the state line to, to monitor people as they're coming in from Louisiana to Mississippi? Well, I, I will tell you, we have had conversations with respect to that. I have spoken multiple times over the last several weeks with Governor Edwards in Louisiana, and he, like everyone else, is working day and night to get this under control. Uh, it's a little more complicated in Mississippi than, say, it is in Florida in terms of checkpoints because we've got an awful lot of people in Mississippi who work and play in New Orleans, and we've got a lot of people in New Orleans who actually own residences, own properties, own deer camps, et cetera, in Mississippi. And so we have a very transient population. And so with our shelter in place order, we're making sure that every Louisiana resident that comes into Mississippi understands that that applies not only to Mississippi residents, it applies to everyone that's coming into our state as well. We have advised that everyone should self isolate for the next 14 days, whether you're traveling from Louisiana or some other state around the country. And so I don't, I don't foresee us coming to the point where we actually put checkpoints at the state line. This virus does not know um, state lines or county lines. It doesn't know demographics and it doesn't really know if you're a Republican or a Democrat. It, it spreads amongst all of us and we've got to, we've got to be, understand that and we've got to be sensitive to our fellow man. And we've got to do the things ourselves to keep this spread from, from exacerbating. Do you feel like you're still seeing too many people who are outside their homes even with the shelter in place order in effect? Well, what I believe, Megan, is that most people are complying. Uh, we were speaking a little bit earlier. I went on a jog earlier uh, in the weekend, and, and as, I, as I ran around downtown Jackson, I literally, for uh, about a 45-minute period, saw less than four people. And, and of the four people I saw, two of them I see fairly regularly. And so I saw two uh, people that I don't see regularly. Um, that's obviously a unique circumstance. But I think generally speaking, most people are complying, but I cannot reiterate enough. If we could get 100% compliance over the next 12 days, I feel confident that we can slow the spread so that we don't put the strain on our hospital system so that we can treat the patients that need treating so that they can get the care that they need and deserve. And if we're successful at doing that, uh, then it's going to allow us to get back to normal and admittedly, it may be a new normal, but it's going to get us back to a new normal sooner uh, rather than later. If uh, large segments of our population do not comply, if they're out and about and trying to do groups of 10, we're going to try to break you up. But even if we're unsuccessful at finding you or seeing you, if large numbers of people do not comply, then this could go on for weeks and weeks and months. And that's not good for anybody. Mm. You know, we have gotten a lot of calls and emails, especially when the shelter in place order was first issued, from people surprised that their jobs were considered essential. They were surprised that their workplaces would still be open, that so many workplaces in their view were still open during this crisis. What, what would you say to say to that? Well, when we, when we started looking at the essential uh, operations of of the state of Mississippi, we, we utilized the guidelines from the United States Department of Homeland Security. And we built upon that based upon some of the things that we know um, are unique to Mississippi. But the vast majority of those guidelines actually came from the federal government. Um, the fact is, we have to keep the supply chain moving. We have to make sure that our healthcare workers can get to treat the patients that need it. We have to ensure that, that folks can can that are driving their uh, trucks from point a to point b to supply our grocery stores and our pharmacies are able to do so and we've got to make sure that our grocery stores and our and our um, pharmacies and and other essential goods and and services are available for our people to get what they need what we can't have is a rush on the grocery store or a rush on a pharmacy um, because that'll lead to panic and panic is not what we need now. We need caution, but not panic. And so that's what we're focused on. I want to talk a little bit about um, the economic crisis that we have here in Mississippi and I mean around the country as a result as a result of this. I believe you mentioned yesterday that unemployment claims in Mississippi have spiked 3000 percent. 
a staggering, a staggering number. What would you say to those people who have been trying for days now to file unemployment claims and still can't get through? Well, th there's no doubt. We, we, we have a short-term public health crisis that we're trying to manage, but we also know that this short-term public health crisis could lead to a long-term economic crisis. Um, it, my heart breaks for those individuals who have lost their jobs in the last couple of weeks. Uh, keep in mind that um, a couple of weeks ago, Mississippi had less than 1,000 new unemployment insurance claims. The week after that, we had 5,500 unemployment insurance claims. And the week after that, we had over 30,000 unemployment insurance claims. And my heart breaks for every single one of you that have experienced this to no fault of your own because of this virus. Um, and so what I would say to individuals that are frustrated, I hear you, I know you're frustrated and I know it's hard to get in on those lines. Um, I would just say to you this, to those individuals that are working the call center, Think about it like this. If you were asked to do 3,000% more work tomorrow than you did today, do you think you could immediately do that smoothly without any, without any challenges? And I think most Mississippians that are reasonable would understand that that's just not realistic. So here's what we've done to try to address it. We have increased by significantly the number of people who are working in the call centers. We have increased the hours from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the call center to 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week. Uh, we have also allowed for you to go online and file for unemployment insurance at our WIND job centers. Now the job centers are closed, but you can go online and there is an email where you can file for unemployment and those workers will help you. But most importantly, what I can say to the people of Mississippi who have lost their jobs, is you're going to get paid. You're going to get paid what you are owed, and it's not when someone answers the phone, it's when you are laid off. And so we are going to make sure that you get paid, dated back to whenever you were actually laid off, and, and we're gonna make you whole. Um, I know people are frustrated, and I understand it, and we are doing everything possible to get the number of people that we need at the call centers at the Employment Security Commission and Jackie Turner and her team are working around the clock to make that happen. How long will it take for the federal stimulus money, which I believe is an extra $600 a week for out-of-work Mississippians, how long will it take for that money to come here and be available? Well, there, I believe it was Saturday night about 10 days ago at 7 p.m. when I actually signed the Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, I did it within 24 hours of the bill being signed by the president. Uh, I went to their offices to do it. I toured the call center um, at that time, they told me it would take a couple of weeks to reconfigure our technology to be able to pay that. And I actually was on a call with Secretary Mnuchin of the Treasury Department yesterday, and he said it would probably take another couple of weeks from um, their perspective to actually get the money distributed out to the states. And so I'm hopeful sometime in uh, mid to late April uh, that we will actually have those resources and we'll be able to get those out uh, to the people who are entitled to them. But it's, we're a couple of weeks away. But again, I will remind everyone, you will be entitled to that additional money dated back to when you actually were laid off, not when you actually filed unemployment or when we actually get the money in the state. So you will get paid uh, what you're entitled to. And, and I know you know this, but that's, that's, it's hard to hear for the families who may have kids and they're out of work and they have run out of money to hear that they're going to have to wait weeks uh, to get what they're, what they're owed. Yeah, there's no doubt. It, this is a hard time for so many people. I, and what, what I'm asking the people of Mississippi to do is if you know that you have a family member or if you know that you have uh, a neighbor that is that is struggling, that, that maybe got laid off, uh, please reach out to them and see what you can do to help. If you have resources available, reach out to them. Um, you know, we had a, a situation this past weekend where we were wishing happy birthdays to people that are having birthdays right now because it's really tough on these kids that are used to having parties that aren't able to do so and one of the things that we found is that one particular lady who asked me to wish her daughter a happy birthday said that she wasn't able to get a cake and 
we were able to reach out to the people of Mississippi and say, could anybody help this family out? And I promise you, before the sun went down on that day, there had been a cake and ice cream delivered. And those are the kind of stories that just warm my heart. But for the next couple of days, reach out, see if you can help your neighbors. Some people just need a little bit of food and some people just need a little bit of money uh, to get through the next uh, week or two until we can get these benefits to them. You mentioned kids, so I want to ask you about schools. Uh, we've been learning from each other at home for uh, about a month now, or almost a month now. Uh, when you're looking at the number of cases expected over the next few weeks, do you believe that you will have to extend the school closure past April 17th? Well, the, the school closure is, is until um, April 17th, which is actually a Friday. So um, our stay at home order, our shelter in place order, our school closures, they all come to fruition on April the 20th. We're going to monitor where we are. We're going to monitor the data over the next seven to 10 days and ultimately make a decision on that. Um, we are hopeful uh, that if everyone will comply, that we actually are slowing the spread as the models now predict. Uh, that we can actually get things back open sooner rather than later. Now, I don't know that it's going to be on exactly that date, but we're going to try to give parents as much notice as possible because we know that, that that in and of itself creates challenges for parents who are trying to work in essential operations, um, and we understand the time constraints there. Uh, but I can't answer for sure right now, but we're going to do everything we can to get kids back in school as soon as possible and get people back to work as soon as possible as well. I want to talk to you about online learning or this distance learning and, and how successful you think that has been. And, and look, I know you have three daughters. How How is it going in your house? Well, what I would tell you is I think generally speaking, distance learning is going better than we could have anticipated two months ago. Uh, but it, it's not going as well as it needs to. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, it, it, it varies between schools. It varies between school districts. It varies even between individuals that may be going to the same schools and so we've got a we've got tens of thousands of educators all across the state that are working diligently to make sure that kids are still learning I'm, I'm favorably impressed with what people are doing you know we're doing everything from learning on tablets in some districts to some school districts actually have um, delivered paper and pens and supplies for their students to learn along with their lesson plans and so uh, I'm, I'm encouraged that we're seeing a lot of innovation in that regard and I just hope that we continue to do so. What are you seeing or hearing in districts where there's real limited access to the internet in Mississippi? Well obviously that, that creates a challenge. Um, you've got districts that are have limited uh, access to the internet and that's one of the things that uh, that I think we will get better at as a state and as a nation is ensuring that we have rural broadband. Um, I, I think that this particular crisis has gotten educators across the state and across the country rethinking uh, their approach with distance learning. I think we can do a lot of learning in Mississippi uh, utilizing uh, resources that are available. I'm excited about the potential innovation that comes out of this, but there's no doubt that some are at a disadvantage right now because of the lack of technological advancements in certain communities and quite frankly it's in certain areas of, of all communities and so we're working hard to think through what does that look like long term but in those areas most of the school districts and the leaders are doing what they can to make sure lessons get to uh, individual students and, and I'm, I'm pleased that everyone's working hard to make that happen. Governor of course you know this weekend is Easter a big weekend in Mississippi every year. What would you say to people about attending a church service this weekend? Well, uh, you know, that's one of the things that we've had a lot of conversation about. One of the th first things that I did is is we, we decided that, you know, most Mississippians at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday are in Sunday school. And so I decided to do a devotional and uh, reading scripture at 9.30 on, sun, on the first Sunday morning back three weeks ago. And we, Ely and I and Emma and Tyler and Maddie have all joined together and done that in each of the last two Sundays. What I would say to Mississippians is that Easter is not about a specific service. It's not about a specific building. And it's not even about a specific messenger. Easter is about celebrating the fact that Jesus is risen and that he has 
come to this earth to, to die on the cross to save us from our sins. And so we can celebrate Easter without going to a building and endangering ourselves and our neighbors with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Now, it breaks my heart to say that because I know there are many folks that, that attend church every single week, and then there are some in Mississippi that only go on, on Christmas and Easter. And so I, I really wish we could get literally uh, millions of Mississippians in churches across the state this upcoming week, but I don't believe that would be safe. And I have to recommend that people do not go into large groups of 10 or more. Um, but that doesn't mean that we aren't going to celebrate Easter. It doesn't mean that we're not going to continue to worship. But still this weekend, maintain that social distance. Stay in your own home, if at all possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Governor, we have just over a minute left. Uh, what is your closing message to the people of Mississippi? And even more specifically, what do you anticipate the new normal for us being once we get past the peak of these cases? Well, to the people of Mississippi, I want to say thank you for complying with our shelter in place order. Thank you for complying with social distancing. Thank you for staying out of groups of 10 or more. You are making a difference in your community, and I'm so proud of you for doing it. Thank you, and God bless you. Let's continue to do it over the next couple of weeks, and we will eventually get back to that new normal. And I believe that new normal is going to be a, similar to after 9-11, where we had so many more TSA agents at the airports. Uh, there's going to be a new normal, but it's going to be a new normal that we can adjust to and continue to live our lives, continue to worship uh, with our friends and family, and continue to gather with our friends and family, and continue to grow our economy. And, and last thing for you, Governor, what have you learned already through this crisis that you think you will take with you through the rest of your term? Well, the thing that I have learned throughout this crisis that I will take with me throughout my term is that uh, people are paying attention. Uh, people are, uh, by the, the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, are, are watching us on uh, newscasts such as this one right here. People are, are starving for information, and the most important thing we can do is, is be transparent, to be honest, to show that we are competently trying to execute our plan to protect all Mississippians, but also understand the struggles that people are going through. Um, and, I, and I'll never forget this time. Uh, as long as I have the opportunity to serve and quite frankly as long as I live. And so again the message to Mississippians is this will pass. Take it seriously. Stay home. Enjoy the time with your family to the extent that you can. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you Governor Tate Reeves for taking the time to speak with us tonight. As you heard from the governor the message it remains the same. Stay at your home. Do what you can. Do your part to help slow the spread of this disease. We are we are still at least a week away from seeing the peak of COVID-19 here in Mississippi. Here at 16 WAPT, we have a saying of our own. Be safe, be sanitary, be strong, and we will get through this. If you missed any of this conversation with Governor Reeves, you'll be able to find it on WAPT.com. Thank you for watching and good night.